subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, our lovely viewers. Always waiting for us to be on your screen for us to learn something. Today we are going to journey through an exciting episode in the field of biology, what is called the science of life. I am your facilitator, Osei Kwame Amwaten, and I'll take you through cell as a unit of life, part two. There's a series about five of them that will help us finish the entire cell topic. We treated in our previous lesson the history of cell, mentioning scientists like Robert Hooke, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, Schwann, Vikos, Theodore, all of them, their contribution. We moved on to come to define what we call the cell. From there, today we have another assignment to undertake. At the end of today's lesson, you, the student, will be able to explain the concept of cell as a basic unit. Then we also will be able to describe the eukaryotic cell and functions. So we'll take some things of the eukaryotic cells and study them. Then we'll tell you the functions of these things. So grab a book, take your pen or pencil. If you have any other resource material, put that alongside you. Then we'll help you be able to understand the biology you read. Let me ask again the definition of cell one of the shortest definitions after inhibition in biology. We ask, what is a cell? We define as a basic unit of life or basic unit of a living organism. I will be able to give brief explanation just as a form of recap, but if you're able to get our previous lesson on part one, the whole picture was on, uh, revealed there. We say it's a basic structure and functional unit of a living organism. We gave it as an analogy to a wall, a normal wall, which is made up of rectangular blocks, which have been put together to form the wall. So like a human being, we have cells which are like a block, which are put side by side millions and trillions of them that makes up your body. Now, in that definition of a cell, which is say the basic unit of a living thing, has three words there, which is critical to understanding the concept. One is the word basic. We use the term basic for a reason. For anything to be a living thing, the fundamental thing within the organisms that we can base on to say this is a living thing, this is not a non-living thing, is the cell. So for anything being a living thing, then that basic thing is like a building. The basic thing used in building a house is just a block. It has cement or brick. It has to be in a block form so that you keep building it up. So every building around you is believed to have blocks. So the basic Building thing, a basic thing in a, a building or a wall is just a block. Same with all living organisms, from unicellular organism to multicellular organism. The basic thing that you should have for which we can base on to see an organism is the cell. Why the word unit? We use the word unit as a discrete entity, discrete thing or a discrete body that can exist on its own and will not be controlled by the other. So if you take the wall again and assume one block is just closed by the next block, although they all together make the wall, all the blocks in the wall are individual blocks on their own. Same in your body too. 
all the cells, though they communicate in a certain way to let us function, each cell is on its own as a discrete entity, meaning it has its own cover, it has its own content, its own organelles that help it function on its own. So one cell can die, the next one may not be dead. One cell can be doing something, the next cell may not be doing the same thing because they are discrete on their own. And we say living or things, and I just, I just think I explained that part along with the basic, that once you are alive, and we classify as a living thing, you need to have a cell. So all living things, called living things, always have a cell in it. So we'll get to a stage where we would debate about virus, whether virus is a living thing or it's not a living thing. From there, one thing you should know is the cell theory. Many scientists over 200 years were able to, at each decade, try to reveal a little of the cell we'll be studying. So the cell that you know today has taken over 200 years plus, or 300, keep counting, because we keep discovering things. And we are still studying it. So the nice discussion we have today, that you feel is just that simple, has taken years to do. And out of that years, they came out with a mantra or what we call the cell theory. First, they concluded that it's a theory, it's not a law, it's a theory. They concluded that all living things in this world are composed of cell or cells. You watching me is made of trillions of cells. Amoeba, paramecium are made of single cells. Though you are a trillion of cells and you call it an organism, the amoeba, which is single, is also an organism. Whatever your body functions on, amoeba can also function the same way. So in that case, we say that for you to be a living organism, then you are composed of a cell or cells. We have also said it's the basic thing everybody should have, and that you, this big body watching me, you started from either a pre-existing cell or a single cell, and there was a lot of cell division till you became a multi-organism. So if you are single too, you came from another single organism. If you are multiple, you came from a single organism. So what we conclude on the cell theory point three says that cells arise from previous existing cell. Then scientists will come into the debate. So where did the first cell come? come from. We will hold it over there. Religious people will explain. The scientists also have their own explanations. So let's hold it there. Where it, the first cell came from, we can't debate it now. So the cell that I've tried to bring your mind to, we have a drawing of this on your screen, a simplified one of course, using a light microscope. But this is what scientists have generalized it as a diagram. They just picked from different cells, which are all plants, try to put major organelles in it, those of animal cells to um, major things. So it doesn't mean you see 100% all this in all cells. On your left, you have the plant cell. On your right, you have the animal cell. Take some seconds to look at how we've depicted certain things in both sides. Some names, you pointed to the same thing in both cells. Use observational skills that we've taught you in Form 1. Look at it very, very, very well. The cells look, the, the nucleus look the same. Both have cytoplasm, both have nucleolus, both have mitochondria, both have vacuoles, both have cell membrane, but one has a cell wall, one don't have. So we move to the next slide. So after giving you what you just saw, we'll come back to more pictures of this. The question was, how were they able to study the nucleus, the mitochondria, the vacuole, all these things that you saw? 
There are about six methods they've used so far. First is just using the light microscope or the electron microscope. Remember the light came before the electron. So over years, we're using these light microscopes to study the cells. They drew them, give descriptions of them. The electron microscope made it better for us. So based on electron microscope studies, we're able to get detailed analysis, pictures, and descriptions of our cell. The next is cell fractionation. In cell fractionation, the whole idea is to find a way to grind, to rupture, to break a cell and pour its content out. So as much as a cell is million times smaller than normal grain of a sand, scientists are able to also develop machines that can help us cut that small bag-like structure so that all the liquid in it, all the content are poured out so that we can pick them one after the other and study them. When they pour them, because it's a little bit sticky, they pour this into a tube and will centrifuge it, means that they will whirl it around in a machine called a centrifuge. The machine whirl it around with force so that the heavy things will drop to the bottom, the lighter ones will be up. You can easily pour the top one and study the heavy material and also study the liquid at the top. The micro dissection is another method where they will put a cell under a microscope. Take small, small, smaller or tiny instruments, push it through or pierce through the cell, remove one at a time and begin to study them. If you tell you the size of a cell, you'll be shocked, but scientists are able to do this. Then we have the biochemical experiments using chromatography and other chemical processes to study the nature, the chemical nature of every part of the cell, the organelles, the liquid, whether they are acidic, they are basic, the way they rise on the paper, the chemists are able to interpret it as such. Then we use stain as part of it. If you use different dyes to stain a cell, different organelles will show up in different forms. And these were what helped the scientists to be able to study and come out with all that we are going to study today. So let's look at a lot of pictures. So the first one I showed you was more of the hand drawing. This one is also, but this one is a little bit deeper with more specific drawings. For example, how we represent the Gorgi body where I've used a red pen. Look at how we endoplasmic reticulum, how it's drawn, how it's shown. Look at mitochondria in both sides, how it is drawn and shown. So in exams, you have to draw it as such. These are ways you show it because in exams, Gorgi endoplasmic may look slightly similar, but we are technical way of depicting this. If you don't do it that way, you don't get the marks. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, before you go on, let's look at, at the center of the animal cell, you see a nucleus. But you see it at the, let's say, pushed to the top left corner of the plant cell. You see that the plants have a double membrane. Just, there are two lines covering the double of the plant cell, which is not the same in the animal cell. Gorgi body is, uh, well, mitochondria is the same on both sides. We have vacuole. One is small in the animal size, it's big in the plant cell. You've seen Gorgi body in animals, you see Gorgi body in plants, endoplasmic in animals, endoplasmic in plants. So these are, then look at it well. We are going to study all these one after the other.
Now a more colored picture. A more colored picture of the same things now coming out clearer. These are all light microscope drawings. Now you go on, look at where I've circled at plasmodes matter. We'll talk about it as you go along. So at this stage, just keep observing similarities and differences. You see that in the nucleus, now you see thread-like materials being shown. Thread-like, I'll talk about all this. Now it's becoming thread-like, not the one we saw in the black and white. Let's look at an electron microscope drawing of all these ones. I see ribosomes coming out clear as dotted things in the. You are seeing the tonoplast shown on the animal plant cell. You are seeing Golgi vesicles now shown in the plant cell. You are seeing something called microtubules radiating in the animal cell part where I've underlined. We we'll study all these things. You have seen lysosome showing up also so as we keep showing more pictures to keep improving let's look at another picture as much the other pictures were flat we want to tell you that the cell is not flat as we see it it's a bag like a round thing because it's full of fluid so it has all size that if it's a 3d and we turn it around, it's like a ball, irregular ball for the animal cell. The nucleus appears round within, there's another container. So there is another picture trying to show you that it's not flat. Now I introduce another one, centrioles. You also see cytoskeleton elements. We we'll study all these things. Okay. Another picture from another place to give you another perspective. So the one we saw first looked round, which is more of the animal cell. There is more bordered like hexagonal fixed shape and you saw that all the plants that I kept showing you had that kind of five or six sided of it with a cell wall a double cover so you see that when I show you an animal cell I show you a plant cell so take your time and look at this again there's an, a plant cell Okay, now let's look for the word a cell membrane. Most books also use plasma membrane, this one. We are going to begin the study of the parts of the cell and its function. You start from the outside as if you're entering a house. The first thing that you come across is the cell membrane or plasma membrane. If you go back to the animal cell, you see your plasma membrane also here. For them, it's the first material uh, boundary that you come across. But for the animal cell, it's the second material after the plant. So the after the cell wall. Now, let's look at this thin membrane and Assume that your eye is the electron microscope. We are going to go deep, delve deep, and look at a picture of that thin line that you've seen there that it doesn't appear as just a thin line, but something more. So this is a picture of the cell, the thin line thing you saw as the boundary of it. All of us have it in our body. 
and I will use this to describe so that when we get to the notes, it will be easy. You've seen something one, two. I've seen this as three, this as four, and this as five. Okay, the inner ones, six, seven. Then what's on the top here as eight? We describe the membrane as a thin, as plasma membrane or cell membrane as a thin, delicate material that bounds or surrounds the cell, trying to make the inner content be separated from the outer content, like your house wall. Your wall makes you be able to enter your house. It separates what is in your, inside your house away from the outside prevents things from entering your house. Same we have it here. You use cement, water, and sand to make yours. But in the cell membrane, this material that make up that cell membrane is one, a lipid. So to make it simple, it's fat or oil, as we say it. So we fat and oil together is called lipids. Okay. Now this lipid is depicted as, it has two lines like this. And on top of this lipid is a phosphate molecule on top of it. So this become a phosphate. And this side become the lipid. Together the two is called phospho lipids and you can see the arrangement i've made one and two the top half this drawing i've made the with the phosphate facing the other side the other side is the outside of the cell so when you take your cell as a football there are these round round phosphate lipids which is acting as a boundary to the outside of the ball the same arrangement one also goes to your interior. So you see that I've done one and two, it's kind of the opposite arrangement. So because there are two of that layers shown, we are going to say double phosphate, phospholipid, or we say bi in biology. Bi means two. So it is saying that the cell membrane is made of a bi layer you can see it's made of a double phospholipid layer. Any of them is correct. It is these two layers that are made one facing each other, going around your whole cell. The phosphate one faces the outside, one faces the inside, because your outside is made up of a lot of fluid. Your inside is made of a lot of fluid in your cytoplasm, and they all get attached or attracted to the phosphate. So the phosphate kind of pull water to itself. When they pull the water, but the lipid prevents water from entry because oil and lip, uh, water don't mix. This arrangement is made in such a way to help what we call, we will have what we call phosphate, uh, phosphate groups and we have non-phosphate we have the phosphate uh, lipid allowing things like the uh, polar substance to enter and non-polar substance not to enter. So two substances are getting into your system, a polar substances and non-polar substance. The non-polar substance will have the opportunity to pass through the lipid side. But those who are polar, where would they pass? Polar substance like your sugar or like glucose, water and stuff, where would they pass? I've already said that water, which is polar, will not pass through lipid, which are non-polar. So what the water does, that is going to pass through this rounded pair of things you see on your screen, which are inserted within the phospholipid layer to allow certain substances which cannot pass through the phospholipid to be able to pass through these round things. 
Now, these round things that I keep mentioning round things are protein materials or substances. So what it means is that within this phospholipid, which is more of lipid oil or fat, are embedded or inserted protein within them. And I've just said that the function is that non-polar substance will pass through the lipid site, then polar substance will pass through this protein by a two proteins with a pore. The protein that you see on your screen, see that there's a space in between them. That space is referred to as a pore. So anything that wants to pass has to pass through the space there to enter the inside. If things also want to move from your interior to the exterior, they also need to pass through this pore. So what it means is that every globular protein embedded in a cell membrane has within it a pore that allows movement of substance in and out. Now let's try with a little understanding to look at our notes now. So I said the cell membrane is very delicate, thin and flexible. That houses or surrounds and enclose the cell. I also said that it separates one cell from the other like a house from the next house and also from the external environment. The cell is composed of Two, the cell membrane is composed of two layers. That's the top row and the down row facing each other, as we saw in the drawing. We describe this as a bilayer or a double layer. Each layer contains lipids. Attached to each lipid is the phos phosphorus element that I showed you the drawing. And so it is called a phospholipid or a biphospholayer. I also showed you the proteins within them. So we say within the phospholipid arrangement are protein molecules, which are globular, that means round in shape, with adjustable pores. That means the uh, let me the word tiny holes within this protein, and they are all embedded within the phospholipids. Now I'm going to make this point and we'll go back to show you where this thing exists. Now, some of the protein we spoke about are only embedded in one layer, whilst others are placed across the length of the two layers. So let's go back. So you see that these ones who have pointed four, five to eight, and the third one are able to cross from the top layer across the down layer. But now let's go to your left side, where I pointed the one with chains on it. You see that it's small, it's only in one layer. It can be found in only the top layer, whilst another one also can be found in the down layer. So we said some are partially embedded and some are fully embedded. Whether fully embedded, partially embedded, we call them the integrated protein because they are found within the phospholipid. Whilst the blue one you see down here are called the peripheral proteins. They are not inside the phospholipid. They are just outside it. So we have the peripheral proteins. We'll come back to explain these things. Now the number eight. I'll mention its name as you go along. Look at it very well. It's like chains of something. We have another one, number five. Carbohydrate protein of glycoproteins. We'll explain all these as we go alongside. Now, in biology, there's a way we describe our cell membrane, a term to describe the nature of how it behaves as a cell membrane. We call the fluid mosaic model, which are described by S.J. Singer and J.L. Nicholson in 1972. It's used the idea of tiles we have in our house. If you look at the tiles in your house, if you look at the tiles in your house, you find out that they are square and there are designs on it. 
no matter how you move from one square to the other, you look at, you see that the pattern keeps being the same. It may look like you've not moved, but you've moved. That is the idea we have here. In the fluid mosaic model, you look at the embedded protein and also the phospholipid. Lipids are fluid, so they keep moving. But as they keep moving, the arrangement of the protein may look to you as if it has not moved, but it has moved. But because when it moves, the same pattern of arrangement keep being the same. You may not see if it has moved, but if you put numbers on them, you see that number one has moved to the number 10 position, 10 have moved to 6 position, 6 have moved to the third position, and it kind of moved in that order. So because it's fluid movement, and it maintains the same pattern, which is mosaic, we call it the fluid mosaic model. That is why we described Singer and Nicholson in 1972, described it as the fluid mosaic model. On your right, to what I used to explain the fluid mosaic model, is a hand drawing. I keep giving you hand drawing because in exams, you will be required to draw. You can't draw the picture types, the color types. You can only draw the hand one. So always, I try to give you a hand drawing. So on your right, that's E, you see a hand drawing with all what you studied under the colored one. Now the functions of cell membrane. We just said that some things can pass through the pores, go out, something from inside to come, move from the inside to go out to the outside. But not everything just can come in because the pore size and the nature of the thing coming in. So what we say is that then the cell membrane is controlling or regulating the passage of substance into and out of a cell. So we describe that whole phenomenon as being semi-permeable. Permeable means to pass through, but it's semi. Not everything passes through. As a wall separates one house from the other, we see that it says as a what a barrier between the cell and its environment. It also holds one cell together because the outer part of it. So for another cell to come close, it has to touch this before they co can communicate. It also gives shape and flexibility to the cell. It delimits the content, the inside content. The content can flow just like water flowing anywhere. So it kind of serves a boundary, delimits the cytoplasm and its content, and limits it to a particular place. So these are the functions of your cell membrane. From the outside, we are going to the inside. So let's go back to a picture of this. So from this plasma memory, which I'm tracing it, all this side, all the interior side, the space there is occupied by something. That space, the site, the space, site to the cells space is occupied by a fluid. So we call the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm. In the technical sense, it is the space plus the fluid or whatever is there. No only the fluid plus other things together is what we call the cytoplasm. There are many things there. So at your level, the space and the fluid portion that occupies the interior of the cell is actually called the cytoplasm. In some books you read, they will tell you the distance between the membrane and the nucleus. That space and the fluid that fills there is the cytoplasm. In that same cyto too, there will be some skeletons there we call the cytoskeleton, which will come back to all this. So let's look at the fluid part first, the cytoplasm. Scientists, after drawing it out through fractionation or the methods we said they use, were able to feel it and know the content of this fluid. And they describe it as a jelly-like and transparent fluid or semi-fluid 
which occupies the space between the membrane and the centrally placed nucleus. Now this fluid, which is about 90% water, is called a cytosol. A typical example that is so close and it's almost it's the same is your egg, your raw egg. When you crack a raw egg, you see a yellowish thing, which is the nucleus. Then the albumin, take it, fill it with your hand. It's sticky, jelly-like nature. That is what we are talking about. That is a clear example. So that thing we feel is what we are talking about. And you say it's made up about 90% water. Now that space that is filled is not only water that is occupying between the cell membrane and the, site, uh, the nucleus. I said that one is the fluid, but other things are also scattered within this fluid. These things have been classified into two groups. One is called the cytoplasmic organelles which are the living part, we'll explain what the living things are. Then other substances which are classified as non-living, one it can grow, it doesn't have a specific function as in helping the cell growth, I refer to as the cytoplasmic inclusion or egastic substances. Now, what do the, cyto uh, the fluid do actually for the cell? Does it just occupy space there? Not really. Because it's fluid, it can move. As it moves, it carries along substance from one place to the other. So it's be behaving like what? A transport medium. And you know, river, streams carry things from one place to the other. Same, it does. When the cytoplasm, which is the liquid is moving, we call it cytoplasmic streaming. So the, when the cytoplasm is moving from one place to the other, it is termed cytoplasmic streaming. Because that is also where all, cell, all organelles or substances are found, reactions will take place within this fluid environment. This it's the, the, the chemical reactions that take place is called metabolism. So we say that cytoplasm is where all metabolic or metabolisms take place. In metabolism, as I said, it's a chemical reaction. So when substances come in, contents of the cytoplasm, which are chemical in nature, will also react with the foreign thing that has come in, turn it to something those good ones are added to the cell and we call that one synthesis or anabolism. If it is bad and the cell don't need it, they will break it down and remove it. The, presence, the chemical reaction of breaking it down to remove it is called catabolism. So it means that metabolism has two different types. One is anabolism and one is catabolism. So I've almost described the function of the cytoplasm, which I said that all living substances, including nucleus, are suspended in the semi-fluid. The streaming, that's the movement, brings about interchange or transport of material between one organelle to the other within the cell. Then certain things which are called non-living, the inclusions which are vital chemicals are also stored in it. Then is a site for where a lot of metabolic at activities take place. Now let's go to a part that will begin a series of studies of minute organelles, minute substances we didn't call the organelles. When we got the cytoplasm, that scientists have classified all the content of the cytoplasm into two, living part and the non-living substances. The living substances are called the organelles. The non-living substances are described as cell inclusions. Then, now 
Delving deep into the organelle, let's look at all what you need to know about it. Now, we say organelle is a minute membrane-bound structure within an eukaryotic cell that has a specific function. Now, when we have organelles, the main idea of organelles is what we call compartmentalization or division of labor. There are many jobs to be done by the cell or to keep the cell active. And if they hope, if you have a house and there are no walls to separate a kitchen from your washroom, from your hall, from your library, from your garage, how would the place look like? If you cook, to just go to your bedroom. If you use the washroom to go to your kitchen, the sun to go to your kitchen. So the same idea we divide the house into parts. Same the organelles have done that for us. So that something can take place in the mitochondria and can go on as, as the same time something is going on in the nucleus, the same time something is going on in the lysosome, so that there is no uh, disruptions. In addition, then one place also becomes specialized for something like your house kitchen is for cooking. Same, we have one organelle specialized for this. And we know that whenever we go here, we are going to get this result. So that's what it helps. So organelles bring division of labor and also divide our cell into compartments. Now these organelles, as I define at the top, students always ask the definition as a problem. Yes, in truth, it has a problem, but it's an accepted definition for now. We said a minute membrane-bound structure. So it has to be covered by something, but not all organelles are covered. So when we start the organelle, we go into classification of organelle. We say we have membranous organelles and non-membranous organelles. So the membranous ones have a cover around it, maybe single or double. <coughs> And those with no membrane, no membrane, are called a non-membranous organelle. The membrane I'm talking about is the same membrane I described when I started from the plasma membrane. So when I say membrane, it's a biphospholayer that covers a cell. For some, it is twice, or we say double. Others, it's single. So organelles with... Membranes are mitochondria, vacuole, ribosomes. Sorry, let me cancel. Ribosome do not have membranes around. Endoplasmic, Golgi, lysosome, centrioles, chloroplast, and nucleus. The non membrane are ribosomes, centrioles, and cytoskeleton. Another term I need to bring to your attention is protoplasm. Remember, we said that. When you start from the outside, the membrane, and there's a nucleus. I said the space there is filled with a fluid. That's a cytoplasm. When you go to the nucleus, I just said to the nucleus. When you enter the nucleus, that is its own cytoplasm. Let me use a word like that, its own cytoplasm. We call that one the nucleus plasm. It also houses a lot of things, and a lot of things goes on. So we see that, that there are two main reactional centers, the cytoplasm side, the nucleus side. These two parts together, to the nucleus by the cytoplasm together, is referred to as the protoplasm. Now let's study one organelle today. The next time we'll continue with many other organelles. The first organelle, which is so central to the whole cell study, is the almighty nucleus. The almighty nucleus. I will go back to pictures. Then we'll come back to finish. So take a minute or so to read what you can read on your screen. I'll go back. Then step by step show you all the parts. So you see it's round. It's spherical. It is centrally placed in plant animals. Pushed somewhere in plants. Found between... That's in the plant found between the vacuole and the cell membrane. Whenever we stain it, it appears darker than all, all organelles. The number of membrane is double. Then we have something we call pore to allow that. 
So let's move on to a picture. Then we'll come back to the notes. So it is spherical. So I've given you two pictures, a kind of 3D round ball and the, uh, the 2D drawing, which is flat. So let's type the 2D flat one. It is spherical, the one on your right. Spherical is round. Then it's a membrane. This is membrane. So it's double, one, two. Double membrane. Another name for nuclear membrane in the study of nuclear is called nuclear envelope. This envelope is not a continuous material. But as it keeps going, there will be small holes within them. And like, as I said, the small holes are called pores. And these pores always allow substance to move in or out of an organelle. So you will see spaces referred to as nuclear pores. Then when you get into it, you see thread-like materials that we can call chromatin. Some would have moved on to a stage called chromosome. So we have chromatin and chromosomes in the nucleus. Then there's another rounded darker portion within the nucleus called the nucleolus. Again, another darker portion within the nucleus, which houses some DNA and some RNA. And this is where we produce or we make ribosomes from. So now let's look at the picture again. It is round. On the rounded one, the 3D drawing, you see holes or pores there. We call the nuclear pores. When you enter inside, there is also a fluid within the cell, which is called nucleoplasm. Within nucleoplasm are other structures within it, which are the chromatin, the chemical form we say is a DNA. Then we have some of the chromatin moving on or thickening up into a structure called chromosome. Then we have a darker portion called the nucleolus. And I said the nucleolus contains some small segments of DNA RNA to make ribosomes. Now, there's only one nucleus in a cell. And two, they appear darker than all the others. And you can see them mostly under, when you use the onion skin, or they say the onion membrane to study the cell. You see boundaries, but I see a dot there. When your teachers take you through, you see a dot somewhere, that dot, black thing. If you can't see anything, it's the one that will come out. And that is your nucleus. So these are the few things you need to know about the nucleus. So let's get back to our notes. First, we said it was large. You just saw it. It's round. You saw that. About 10 micrometer in diameter. In animals, it is centrally placed in plant cells found between the vacuum and the cell membrane. I said when it appears, even when others don't appear, but when you stain it, it appears darker than the other organelles. We saw that there are two sides of it. So we say it's a double membrane or nuclear envelope. We separate the nucleus from all the other contents of the cytoplasm. We also say that nuclear envelopes has pore, which allow movements of substance in and out from the nucleus. Then the ribosomes that we just saw, that I said was made by the nucleolus. When they come out, they get attached, some get attached to the outer surface of the nu nuclear envelope. Then the interior, I said that there's a liquid called nucleoplasm, I spelled there. Within it are long thread-like material we saw underlined as chromatin or DNA. For them to fit, they are so long, but they fit because they're able to wrap themselves around what we call histones, protein structures called histones. 
So like a thread, the thread we used to sew our patterns are so long, but because they wrap around something. So the thread now is a chromatin. That uh, hard material the thread wraps around is called the histones. There, there. So the chromatin and histones at a point would, the chromatin part would change through a process when we get to uh, protein synthesis to change and form chromosomes. And this is where our genetic materials are found on. Genes are found on the chromosomes. So what we say is that the nucleus houses the chromosomes or houses genes, which are what our parents pass on to us for us to look like them. So for you inherit, for you looking like your parents, we say you have inherited something. So we say that the chromosome contains genetic material or genes, which are the hereditary factors. I've also mentioned nucleolus, the plural is nucleoli, which is a dense spherical concentrated grounded dark portion, which contains the DNA and RNA, which I said used to make ribosome. Then the ribosomes are involved more in the protein synthesis. So all of them, the DNA, which will make an RNA, they will come out onto the ribosome and the whole process will go and we call the protein synthesis. So what is the function of the nucleus? For all that I said, you can see that the hereditary material, the genetic information that is passed on for us to look like our parents is where it is housed. But apart from that, it is also the place that governs the sequencing of amino acid, the proteins that I spoke about. When they make the proteins, the proteins that take place, we are able to make proteins, and proteins may either be turned to enzymes, hormones, and other things. That enzymes are what makes all uh, breakdown synthesis take place in our cells. So, in, so in our day, what we are trying to say is that processes that go on in your body is controlled indirectly by enzymes. Who makes the enzyme? The protein synthesis. Who brings things to make the protein synthesis? The DNA deep in your nucleus. So indirectly, it is the nucleus that directs the making of enzymes that direct certain important process in your cell. Without that, the cell can't move on. So we say that it governs the sequencing of amino acids. Because the enzymes are going to control what has to go on in your cell, it is trying to say that it controls, directs, and coordinates all the activities of the cell. Then. The last one is that it initiates cell division. All these topics will be treated later as you go along your syllabus. It has been also proven using amoeba that when you take nucleus out of a cell, the whole amoeba structure can't survive over a week. But when you bring it back, you see all activities light up again. But if you take other organelles away and you leave the nucleus, there's some other organelle, one after the other, the uh, amoeba survives. It proves from that research that then the cell is the central organelle that controls the activities of all other organelles and make the cell functionable. I hope with this lesson, you've gotten a broader picture of the idea of cell, the membrane, the cytoplasm, at least one organelle, which is the key organelle of the cell. In our subsequent study, we'll take some organelles that we mentioned and study them one after the other and see their role within the cell. All too soon, we come to the end of today's lesson. Things will be exciting. So be ready for our next episode. Or you can also read around the other organelles before we come. Send us any question you have or feedback to our YouTube channel. Also watch us on Joy TV.
and we'll be there to support you. Till we meet next time, I say it's a bye-bye from your biology teacher. Bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.